Hey, I don't know if you've been following the internet hot topic of this last month or so, the subject of which is none other than Winston Churchill. The person responsible for this latest conflagration is Daryl Cooper, a guest on Tucker Carlson's podcast and an amateur historian. And I say amateur not to denigrate him, but to set him apart from establishment academia types. A proverbial bomb went off when Cooper said in his conversation with Carlson that he thought that Churchill was the chief villain of World War II. Cue the exploding heads, most of them on the right, and many of whom offered scathing critiques without even listening to the interview or maybe just catching a soundbite. So in case you guys missed this interview, here is the bulk of what they said about Churchill. For example, and I'm American, I'm not English, so I don't have any weird motive in asking this, but how would you assess Winston Churchill? Uh, I got in trouble with my podcast partner, Jocko Willink, one time because he's a New England Dutchman who's his family. It's near and dear to the, they're Dutch, but very near and dear to their heart that Winston Churchill is a hero, right? Well, everyone loves Everyone Churchill. thinks that. He really thinks that. And I told him that I think, and maybe I'm being a little, little hyperbolic, maybe, but I told him, maybe trying to provoke him a little bit, that I thought Churchill was the chief villain of the Second World War. Now, he didn't kill the most people. He didn't uh, commit the most atrocities. But I believe, and I don't really think, I think when you really get into it and tell the story right and don't leave anything out, you see that he was primarily responsible for that war, becoming what it did, becoming something other than an invasion of Poland or just, I mean, at every step of the way, like people are very often, I, I find, surprised to learn. There's, there's a two-step process. Well, right? why, don't, why don't you just make the, ca make the case for that? Okay, so you, you've made your statement. A lot of people are thinking, well, wait a second. You said Churchill, my childhood hero, the guy with the cigar. Yeah. Well, and the next thought that comes into their head he's saying, is that, oh, you're saying Churchill was the chief villain, therefore his enemies, you know, Adolf Hitler and so forth, were... Stalin. The protagonists, right? Yeah. They're the good guys. If you think he's a villain, that's not the case. That's not what I'm saying. Well, yeah. So get back to your, like, your main question about Churchill. You know, if you go to uh, 1939, when the Germans and the Soviet Union invade Poland, uh, as soon as that war's wrapped up on the German side, Hitler starts firing off peace proposals to Britain and France because they had already declared war. He was he didn't expect them to declare war, actually. Like there's a you know a famous scene where he kind of throws a fit when he finds out that they actually did that they did do that. And so he doesn't want to fight France. He doesn't want to fight Britain. He feels that's going to weaken Europe uh, when we've got this huge threat to the east, the communist threat over there. And he starts firing off peace proposals. He says, let's not do this. Like, we can't do this. And of course, you know, a year goes by, 1940 comes around and they're still at war. And so he launches his invasion to the West, takes over France, takes over Western and Northern Europe. Once that's done, the British have, uh, you know, uh, escaped at Dunkirk. There's no British force left on the continent. There's no opposing force left on the continent. In other words, the war is over and the Germans won. Okay. But and, by, but what, by what point? Uh, fall of 1940 right so there's just there's literally no opposing force on the on the continent and throughout that summer adolf hitler is firing off radio broadcasts giving speeches literally sending planes over to drop leaflets over london and other british cities trying to get the message to these people that germany does not want to fight you like we don't want to fight you offering peace proposals that you know it said you keep all your overseas colonies we don't want any of that we want britain to be strong the world needs britain to be strong you know especially as we face this communist threat and so forth like this this is what's going on and so churchill i mean you have a guy who went, he, churchill wanted a war he wanted to fight germany uh and the reason that i I don't begrudge him that, you know, people can, can, national leaders, you can fight whoever you want. If, you know, if you feel like your long-term, uh, the long-term interests of the British Empire are threatened by the rise of a powerful continental power like Germany, and you need to check that, that th those are great power games, and you play them the way you feel like you need to play them. That's fine. The reason I resent Churchill so much for it is that he kept this war going when he had no way, he had no way to go back and fight this war. All he had were bombers. He was literally, by 1940, sending firebomb fleets, sending bomber fleets to go firebomb the Black Forest just to burn down sections of the Black Forest, just, 
just rank terrorism, you know, going through and uh, starting to, you know, what eventually became just the carpet bombing, the saturation bombing of civilian neighborhoods, you know, to kill is the purpose of which was to kill as many civilians as possible. And all the men were out in the field, all the fighting age men were out in the field. And so this is old people, it's women and children, and they knew that. And they were wiping these places out it was as gigantic scaled terrorist attacks, the greatest, you know, scale of terrorist attacks you've ever seen in world history. Why would he do that? Because it was the only means that they had to continue fighting at the time. You know, they didn't have uh, the ability to reinvade Europe. And so he needed to keep this war going until he accomplished what is, you know, what he, what he hoped to accomplish. We know now there's actually a really great series of books. It's, it's one of the best, I recommend it to everybody, but it's really expensive now. And um, it's six long volumes called History of British Special Operations in the Second World War. And one of the books gets into the level of uh, just the extent of media operations, propaganda operations, everything that they were running in the United States to eventually drag us into that war. And that was his whole plan. His whole plan was we don't, we don't have a way to fight this war ourselves. This war is over. We need either the Soviet Union or the United States to do it for us. And that was the plan and kept the war going long enough for that plan to come to fruition. And to me, that's just, it's a craven, uh, ugly way to, to fight a war. And um, what was the motive? Um, well, you know, Churchill's got a, a long and complicated history. I mean, he's, a, you know, he's somebody who. That, uh, that was the wryest smile I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, well, look, I think on one level, there was a sense that Churchill was sort of humiliated by his performance in the First World War yeah. as the head of the Admiralty, and he was out in the cold for a long time. You mean glippily. Yeah. And which, you know, was, that was his operation. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so he was rightly held responsible for that and seen as responsible for one of the great disasters that the British suffered during that war. And so I think part of it was probably kind of personal. You know, he wanted redemption. He wanted to go out there and like prove that he's the the warlord that that they can go out there and and fight this big war. Um, probably. I think part of it, I like I read about Churchill and he strikes me as a psychopath. Um, but he's also a sort of, I mean, he was a drunk. He was very childish in strange ways. People would talk about how as an adult, like at, you know, as prime minister, they'd find him in his room and he's like playing with action figures like war toys and army men and stuff and would get mad when people would uh, would interrupt him, you know, when he was doing that. So this is a strange, strange fellow, you know. But why do you think Churchill has been presented in a way, in the way that he has? Yeah, well, it's, it has to do with what you said earlier, right? Uh, Neville Chamberlain versus Churchill has been the binary model that has uh, served as the the chief rhetorical device for every conflict we've wanted to get into since then. Yes. You know, the entire Cold War and then even after the Cold War in the global war on terror is if you appease them, you're Neville Chamberlain. Hitler's the, uh, rather, Churchill's the one who saw all along where this was headed and was trying to warn people this, you know, Cassandra and... Finally, because nobody listened to him, the war ended up breaking out and we were forced to like go stamp out this threat. And now exactly. it's a much bigger threat than it ever would have been if exactly. we just would have listened to exactly. him. If we had strangled it in its crib. And it's justified be. every conflict, uh, you know, really since the Second World War. Everybody's the new Hitler, right? It's, it, it's, um, and so that it's, a, it's very valuable in that sense. But then also, you know, it really did become the, the, the founding myth of the of the global order that we're all living in now. You know, that's another thing that's actually pretty awful is, uh, you know, as soon as the war broke out, Churchill had all of the German and Italian nationals in Great Britain all rounded up and thrown into concentration camps where they would stay to the end of the war. And this is 1939. And a huge number of those people were Jewish refugees who had come over from Germany to England. And they were just rounded up and thrown in camps for six years. Well, he also had the opposition party thrown in prison for the duration. Oswald Mosley and his wife, uh, right after giving birth, you know, spent the duration. People died. Um, that doesn't look like democracy to me. Now, the right's reaction to this whole thing kind of reminds me of the left during COVID. You, you remember, don't question the science. Uh, the right is now saying, don't question the history. Um, and I'm wondering why. Why can we not question the history? You know, why is it... 
why can we not acknowledge facts? You know, Churchill firebombed civilians. He committed a war crime. Why can't we be honest about that? You know, it's not anti-West or anti-liberty or pro-Nazi to acknowledge that. You know, he put people in concentration camps, you know, much like our own president FDR did during World War II, which was also despicable and an insane violation of human rights. You know, this great defender of liberty and the West was violating people's human rights was slaughtering women and children. You know, why can't we just ask, you know, how do you circle that square? Can we talk about this? Um, but we're not even allowed to talk about it. And it's very, very strange. And as we just heard in the Tucker and Cooper interview, World War II has reached mythical status. You cannot question it. And uh, once he said that, I remembered about six months ago, the issue of um, the bomb, the atomic bomb being dropped on Japan was kind of being talked about a little bit, not as much as this Churchill issue, but it was being talked about. And many on the right were saying like, you know, you cannot question that we dropped the bomb on Japan. It saved, it saved our military from having to go in. It saved so many American lives. It was necessary. You know, this is what we had to do. Um, I'm sorry, but no. Our top military brass was very clear that dropping the atomic bomb was unnecessary. In fact, Admiral William Leahy, Truman's chief of staff, said, quote, The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. In being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children." Unquote. But Truman's administration brought pressure to bear on our brass, and they dropped the bomb. Also, we dropped two atomic bombs on civilians, on civilians, at two cities that were uh, the highest concentration of Catholics and Christians in Japan. Um, interesting. Um, also, oh, who was the U.S. president at the time? Harry S. Truman. He was a 33rd degree ace in May. And no, I can't say the actual word because I will get censored for it. Is, there, is, that, is that a coincidence? I don't know. You tell me. Um, yeah, interesting. But again, not allowed to question the myth of World War II. And let's remember where Winston Churchill kind of got his career kicked off. So if... World War II has been mythologized. World War I has been completely memory hold. I mean, think about it. What did, what did you learn about World War I? Um, that the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo kind of kicked it off. And it was the excuse that Kaiser Wilhelm needed to mobilize his army and conquer all of Europe like he finally like wanted to. And, you know, we're asked to kind of drink down or gulp down this cocktail of propaganda and half truths and move on and move on quickly. And I think there's a reason for that. One of the best books that I've read on the topic is called Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War by Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor. This book is very well sourced and it does a great job of putting cracks in the facade that we've kind of been presented about World War I. And let me, let me just share just a few facts uh, from this book about World War I. For instance, uh, you know, Britain, British propaganda has said that you know, Kaiser Wilhelm is this saber-rattling, crazy you know, Kaiser who wants to conquer all of Europe. Okay, uh, in the decade leading up to World War I, uh, Britain outspent Germany on its military, I think by three to one. Uh, so the complaints, you know, Germany was amassing this military might and this military power. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that that was Britain. <laughs> that was Britain. Um, also, Kaiser Wilhelm loved England. He was Victoria's favorite grandson. He was the, he was Queen Victoria's grandson. She died in his arms. He loved England. He had no thoughts of war against England. Um, it's kind of absurd. If you kind of look at his personal life and his, his own personal attitudes toward England, gleaned from his letters, his, um, his personal writings, um, that idea is absurd. Also, look at these sort of little, there's little ginned up sort of conflicts with Germany, kind of in the lead up to World War I. For instance, uh, there was a like 
yacht-sized gunboat, German gunboat, spotted off of French-controlled portion of Africa. I forget the region exactly. Um, and the British made a huge fuss over this. And, you know, this is an act of war. And and if Germany wanted an excuse to start a war with England, uh, this was it. You know, the British were making a big deal out of this. But the Germans were like, no, no, like, we, we really want diplomacy here. Uh, there are a couple of these little instances. And, and all all uh, kind of ginned up by Britain, which makes you wonder, uh, who was really the aggressor here? Hmm. It's almost like there are elements, British elements, that want this war to happen. And that is exactly the case that the authors of this book make, uh, and they make it very well. The book is very well sourced. The claim that they put forth is that there is this group of uh, elites in the shadows. I know it sounds very woo-woo. The head of which is Cecil Rhodes, as in Rhodesia, the person who that Rhodesia is named after, as in Rhodes Scholarship, that that Rhodes. Um, the control of the group uh, eventually passed to a man named Alfred Milner. Uh, the Rothschilds were part of this group. Uh, and in fact, a recent-ish biography of the Rothschilds, I think it's called House of Rothschilds, uh, the biographer says, quote, How much of the Rothschild's political role remains irrevocably hidden from posterity? Now, the authors of this book don't claim that Churchill was in the secret elite Milner group, but he was a known associate of theirs and was willing to make alliances and scratch their back a bit. As Cooper points out, Churchill was involved in propaganda operations in the U.S. to make us more amenable to the idea of going to war with Britain during World War II. I believe he had the same type of agenda during World War I, when he was the head of the Admiralty. Now, the sinking of the Lusitania by the Germans and the loss of American lives on board happened directly under Churchill's watch, and this event helped to prime Americans for war. Now again, those on the right think that this is preposterous and that Churchill could not have possibly set up the Lusitania to be torpedoed by the Germans. Like for example, Richard A. Langworth, who wrote a piece that was excerpted for a Hillsdale College publication. I pulled up this article to compare and contrast a defense of Churchill in the matter of the Lusitania with the account in this book, also by McGregor and Doherty, called Prolonging the Agony, how the Anglo-American establishment deliberately extended World War I by three and a half years. This is basically the sequel to their first book. One of the discrepancies I found was the issue of the Lusitania's payload. Now, the Lusitania was a civilian ship that was essentially requisitioned by the Admiralty at the outbreak of World War I, as per the agreement between the company that owned the Lusitania and the government that gave them the loan to build her. So although the Lusitania was still ferrying passengers to and fro across the Atlantic, as she had done pre-war, she was also carrying supplies for war, namely munitions, which was against international law. Uh, now, Langford completely pooh-poohs the idea that the liner was carrying flammable gun cotton, and that is the only mention in his entire article of contraband munitions that the Lusitania was carrying. He doesn't mention anything else, just the gun cotton, which is quite a bit of an oversight, seeing that the official manifest of the Lusitania, as reported in the New York Times, did show that she was carrying, quote, a number of cases of cartridges, unquote, which would have been contraband munitions. But it gets better. <laughs> Quoting from McGregor and Doherty, quote, in 2012, the Lusitania's 27-page supplementary manifest for its fateful voyage, never previously mentioned in any document, report, or newspaper, nor referred to at Lord Mersey's later inquiry, was unearthed in the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Archives in the United States. Listed on page 2 of the supplementary manifest are 1,250 cases of shrapnel, not cartridges, shrapnel sent from Bethlehem Steel to the Woolwich Arsenal, together with 90 tons of lard destined for the Royal Navy Weapons Testing Establishment in Essex. Taking even the boxes of cartridges from Remington and Union Munitions Company alone, 4,200 cases, weighing over 125 tons, were consigned to the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich. In addition, large quantities of aluminum, nickel, copper, brass, and rubber were stored inside the cargo hold. 
Now, the Germans knew this, even if Mr. Langford does not. The Germans even attempted to take out ads in American newspapers warning Americans not to sail on these ships as passengers because they would be targeted. Think about this. It was the Germans who fired upon the Lusitania, killing civilians. Okay. But they did try to give Americans the courtesy to inform them of what was going on, that they were being used as meat shields. Neither the British nor the American government gave us that courtesy. And Churchill's admiralty was completely content to use civilians as human shields for his weapons of war. Uh, that alone is disgusting. Mr. Langford is fixated in his article about the lack of guns mounted on the Lusitania and seems to be ignoring, or in ignorance of, that, uh, that this was a mil military ship. Remember, she was acquisitioned by the admiralty, carrying an enormous cache of munitions. As to whether Churchill purposely dangled the Lusitania in front of the Germans, listen to this quote from Churchill in a confidential memo to the President of the Board of Trade. Quote, it is of the utmost importance to attract neutral shipping to our shores, in the hope of especially embroiling the U.S. with Germany. The German formal announcement of indiscriminate submarining has been made to the United States to produce a deterrent effect on traffic. For our part, we want the traffic. The more the better. And if some of it gets into trouble, better still. Unquote. McGregor and Dougherty referred to Churchill's words as a statement of intent. Langford also dismisses the idea that the Lusitania should have had an armed escort through what was known to be German U-boat infested waters. He says that Churchill says that it would have made no sense since the Lusitania was a fast ship, uh, which is interesting because on at least one other previous voyage, she did have an armed escort. I mean, the sinking of the Lusitania and the demonstrable lies and cover-up after the fact really deserves its own video. Uh, suffice it to say that at the very least, Churchill does not come out of this episode looking blameless. And I've got to say, as an American, I don't appreciate him using my fellow countrymen as human shields to guard his contraband munitions, uh, especially we were a neutral country at the time. Uh, nor does his U.S. propaganda campaign during the Second World War much endear him to me. <laughs> The formulation of history is very closely guarded, very jealously guarded. In Hidden History, the author says, quote, Almost every important member of the Milner group was a fellow of one of three colleges, Balliol, New College, or All Souls. The Milner group largely dominated these colleges, and they, in turn, largely dominated the intellectual life of Oxford in the field of history. The influence of the Milner Group at Oxford was so powerful that it controlled the Dictionary of National Biography, which meant that the secret elite wrote the biographies of its own members. They created their own official history of key members for public consumption, striking out any incriminating evidence and portraying the best public-spirited image that could possibly be safely manufactured. Also, get this, so in the 1970s, a Canadian historian, his name is Nicholas Dombrain, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, he was researching uh, in the War Office records, and he notes, quote, The registry files were in a deplorable condition, having suffered the periodic ravages of the policy of weeding. One such clearance was in progress during my foray into these files, and I found that my material was being systematically reduced by as much as five-sixths. Unquote. So in the 1970s, somebody is destroying or disappearing files from World War I? What? Why? Who is doing that? One of the critiques of the Tucker Carlson and Daryl Cooper interview that I thought was pretty good was by Sargon of Akkad. I thought he had some thoughtful things to say. Um, he had some good critiques. Uh, but the one thing I disagreed with him on was that we need to just step over World War II, leave it in the past. We have so much in front of us to deal with and discuss. Uh, while that's true, we do have a lot in front of us. Uh, we really need to get the past right, to tell the truth about it, because the past informs our present. And whoever controls the past controls the present. I th really think we need to start picking over the rubble of the 20th century and going over it carefully, you know, not just discarding things out of hand. You know, sometimes the official narrative is pretty much the truth, and sometimes it isn't. Uh, we need to revisit it. 
And we have been lied to so many times that we've been had. We've been had about so many events in history. It's time to re-examine. And I think that a godly society is a society that values the truth. You know, I think we have such a duty to the next generation to hand down the truth. And uh, I think war is a racket. Uh, it really is. There's a quote from Smedley Butler, Congressional Medal of Honor recipient. Um, he was the Major uh, General of the United States Marine Corps during World War I. He says, quote, War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few, at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. In World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns, no one knows. If you got some value out of this video, please give it a like and share.